name is Todd Boating, and we are really pleased that you could join us here on this Father's Day. Speaking of which, happy Father's Day to all you wonderful dads out there who are uh, doing so much for our country, who are doing so much for your families. And uh, as a result, I want to welcome uh, to today's live lessons from the front, Chris Board, who is a father, who is a, uh, a son of a veteran, who is a veteran himself. And uh, I'm looking forward to this conversation. Chris, happy Father's Day. Welcome to the program. Well, thank you. I appreciate you having me. Absolutely. And, and you know, we, we made the decision to, to do a Father's Day uh, special because, you know, you, you have gone through, you and your family have gone through the one thing that families fear more than anything else when their child serves, uh, and that is losing uh, their son or daughter to, uh, uh, to battle. And, you know, it, it, it's not something that, that I think anyone uh, could relate to unless they've gone through it. But, you know, like we've talked about uh, off, off this program, uh, oftentimes gold star dads are very much forgotten in all of this, and you are a gold star dad. So, again, welcome to, uh, to the program, and, and we, we, we want to know all about your son, Cody Board. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. Um... And, you know, I, I agree with you in the sense that uh, oftentimes the Gold Star fathers are off to the side. But, you know, I, honestly, that's okay because uh, the Gold Star Mothers was started long ago and is an outstanding organization and um, fully support that. And I truly appreciate that. Um, and you're right, though, that it is important as a Gold Star father to be um, I don't want to say recognize, but understood what we went through. I mean, as a veteran myself, I think the biggest shock for me was that even though Cody went off to, you know, the service and, and deployed, um, I just never really put two and two together that that's, a, you know, a real reality until it happened and it hit me. And I took a look at what it was like for me as an officer in the Army and some of the things that transpired, what I would have done, and um, real eye opener, real definitely a real eye opener. And and I and I want to hear about the the fateful day, and I want to hear about your you know when you learned uh, of all that. But take us back to before the military for Cody. Who who was he okay. growing up? Well, Cody was a a very handsome young man, um, very funny young man, and a very tall young man. Um, I'm actually his adopted father. Um, and um, I met his mother and, and we married uh, when he was a very small little boy and immediately I adopted him. And um, he knew from early on that uh, he was adopted and, and that, um, you know, uh, from my side. Um, <laughs> And the important thing was I knew that someday he was going to be tall, blonde hair, blue eyed, and not short and dark hair like me. So I wanted him to understand <laughs> that. And, and he and I were very close in that sense. Um, a very athletic young man. Um, and uh, he actually was kind of a, a timid, quiet young man until he got into uh, the sport of wrestling, which he did through me and my, my background, with my dad being a high school coach. And um, really came into his own in, in terms of sports as far as the as wrestling. He, he picked it up real well and it built up his confidence wonderfully. So, um, yeah, I saw that he was, I saw that he wrestled, but I, I what really stood out to me uh, in my research is that you don't find many wrestler, wrestlers that also run cross country. Yes. And actually that you can, you can give that credit to my father because uh, my dad, as my coach came to me, my, junior year and said you're going to ride the bench on the soccer team and he you know he was good friends with the soccer coach he said you're too small and um you're you're just not going to play he said I think you should go out for cross country and get in shape for wrestling and I was not a runner I hated running but when dad and coach tells you to do that off you go so well fast forward to Cody Cody was tall and slim and had a runner's build and so I talked to him early on and said, hey, I really think you should be a cross-country runner. It'll, one, it'll get you in great shape for wrestling. But two, 
you got long legs, kid, and you could you can do well. And he did. He did. Uh, he he learned how to push himself. Um, he enjoyed his teammates. And um, the really interesting thing was years later, after he he passed away, his his little brother was running at the high school cross country meet. And the first meet I went to, he ran by me, and it was actually deja vu. I mean, he was shorter, but um, just a smaller version of his brother. He had the same stance, the same running, the same breathing. And he ran by me and I was supposed to be videoing and I, I didn't even video because I was in such shock to see him go by like that. So. Wow. So, yeah. Because it kind of felt like it was Cody. Yeah, it did. It did. Yep. And, and Tyler goodness. was really channeling his big brother when he was running. So. I'll be darned. Yep. It, so he, he grew up uh, very in a very athletic um, uh, with a very athletic background. Uh, but if I also remember correctly, he wasn't necessarily a natural athlete on the wrestling mat. He had to work really hard. Yeah. Yeah. He, and honestly, there's, there's few and far between when it comes to natural born wrestlers. Uh, unfortunately I wasn't one of them. My brother and my dad were. And, um, uh, so I learned that early on and, Cody did too. A lot of it was his confidence um, and getting in the practice room. Uh, he looked at it more as just kind of a fun time to kind of screw around. And I kept saying, you got to work at this, you got to work at this. And when he buckled down and started paying attention to the moves and understanding what he was doing, uh, that's when he really truly improved. And um, by the time he was a senior, um, he had done very well for himself. He wasn't a, uh, a region champion or a state champion, but he was on the varsity and did well for himself. So. And so that, that led him, I mean, it was, was it a foregone conclusion that he was going into the military? I mean, is that something that, that he picked up on uh, from you? And, and I know his, his mom's side also had some service. Yes. Where did, where did that bug come in? Well, I, I would like, I think, from me, but I also think from, uh, like you said, his mother's side, uh, both her brothers and her father and her grandfather served. Um, my grandfather served and then I served. And so, and he was old enough before I got out of the military, he was old enough to know, you know, I would come home in my uniform and he would, uh, I'd step out of my boots and he'd put them on and he'd salute me and talk to me. And, and it, there was several Halloweens where he was uh, an airborne ranger and we, you know, I had the beret and, and we did some pretty interesting camouflage on his face and just always talked about wanting to be an airborne ranger. And um, as he, as it came time in high school um, and he kind of realized that he wasn't really certain about what he wanted to do as far as college, but he knew he wanted to be in the military. And so we sat down and talked about it. I actually, I actually told him to look at all the services um, because some of his stuff with his video game type background, I told him to look into the Air Force with some of the stuff they're doing with the drones and stuff like that. But he was focused on Airborne Ranger. And um, I, I kept saying, I, I'm not sure why. I mean, I was an artilleryman, so I got to ride everywhere. I didn't hump everything on my back. <laughs> Infantrymen did. But um it just seemed like that's what he wanted to do. And with the GI bill, the opportunities were going to be there for him to get an education when he was ready. And um, so he, he pushed for that. And uh, one of the interesting things I thought was funny was when he first got to Fort Benning, um, he had kind of, his senior year was just kind of wild and, you know, not taking it real seriously as far as his ASVAB scores. So when he went, he was 11 Bravo but he didn't have an airborne slot and he really wanted airborne. And I said, well, during basic training or um, OSIP as they call it at, at um, Fort Benning, you'll be able to, based on your PT scores, et cetera, you'll be able to pick up a slot because he was frustrated that some of the guys there that had slots weren't really serious about it. And, and um, as it turned out, he ended up, um, not really pushing to get a slot because all of his buddies got assigned to Germany and he had taken German in high school and was excited to go to Germany and said, I'll get airborne later. So he got to go to Germany, enjoy himself. Um, later on in discussions, we talked about uh, he was going to re-up for airborne and ranger and make sure that he got 
all that good stuff. But uh, he he spent some time as a 18, 19 year old kid in Germany enjoying Europe, which was a lot of fun for him. So, and, and what year was this when he enlisted? I uh, graduated in 2009 in uh, first part of June and off uh, late June. It was like two weeks, two or three weeks after graduation. He was gone to basic training, and um, which was good for him. He needed that. <laughs> um, the when we went for his graduation uh, actually it went a couple weeks before for family day um, after he got through giving his mother a big hug uh, turned to me and I could not believe the positive change in him um, I mean he stood taller his chest stuck out and just looked so good in his uniform and I actually said which one's your drill sergeant and he pointed and I said, he said why I said I want to go give him a big hug because he did a nice job. <laughs> He's like, Dad, Dad, please don't do that. Please don't do that. <laughs> but, was uh, was there was there any hesitation anywhere within the family of him enlisting at a, at that time? I mean, it was still a very dangerous time. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and actually, that's one of the things I sat down with him when I talked about the Air Force and other services. Is I told him, I said, listen if you go, you know, airborne ranger, you go infantry, um, you, you're going to go to a unit and they're, they're going to send you to the first unit that's, you know, filling up and you're going to deploy and you need to be ready for that. This is, this is serious kiddo. This is not, you know, I'm going to go to the army and, and train and play around. This is serious. And we're at war in Iraq and Afghanistan, and it's very possible that you could deploy to either one. And um, even surprised myself a little bit as quickly as when he got over to Europe, the, how fast they um, got ready with deployment orders and, and, and during their train up. So, so he didn't get to spend much time in Germany. Um, I think he was probably seven or eight months, uh, enough time to enjoy himself. He, he and his buddies uh, got to enjoy a few of the, Livations and they traveled around by train and saw some different things and saw the countryside and and we got a lot of pictures of him training and always smiling and being goofy with his buddies and um, you know that was that was the nature of him. Uh, his platoon leader uh, Mike told me one time he said I could come to formation and take a look at Cody and see his smile and it would always pick me up no matter what was going on. But he said the other thing was. I had to kind of look at him and make sure that he wasn't getting himself in trouble too, because <laughs> he was up to something. <laughs> he was mischievous in that sense. But, which Interesting. Is good. Yeah, that's good. I mean, he, he really enjoyed his friends and uh, made some, you know, very, very good friends. His roommate was probably his best friend and, um, and they had lots of fun, lots of fun. Do you, do you stay in touch with his, uh, his old roommate? I do, uh, not as much as I'd like to. I'm, I'm more in touch with uh, Mike, his platoon leader, and uh, Ryan, his platoon sergeant. Um, and I don't know if that's just because they're you know, a little older or not, but um, his roommate has, is still in the military, doing very well for himself, um, traveling around, got some more kids. And, and um, so, I, you know, Facebook's nice. You can keep up on what's happening and what's going on. So that's always good. So they deployed to Afghanistan. Um, how long were they in country before that fateful day? Uh, I'm trying to think back to dates now. I think they got in country April, May timeframe um, of October. All right. October is when he passed um, of 2010. So he, he was probably, I think it was April, May time frame they got in country. And um, they initially were tied in with the Dutch. Um, and um, he, he had a few interesting things to say about them. <laughs> Didn't care for them a whole lot. And then his platoon got moved over and tied in with the Aussies. And um, absolutely loved the Australian soldiers. Made some great friends there. Um, and what was really neat about it was the, some of the stuff they had, he was able to make some VOIP calls, phone calls, you know, through the internet back to me. And it would be daytime here, late evening there, and I'd be at work and I'd get a call and it was like he was in the next cubicle. 
and we'd sit and chat and talk for a little bit and which was wonderful to be able to have that you know I went back to when I did it during Desert Storm it was five minutes in a phone center and you could barely hear and it was a collect call that I had to pay for when I got home. <laughs> So, it was it was a little bit different time from a technology yeah. standpoint. Didn't have the emails or anything like that, but um, it was good because phone conversations with him made a world of difference for me. Put me at ease. Um, he would kind of, you know they couldn't tell me where he was or anything like that, but he always wanted to make sure he that I knew that he was technically and tactically sound, whatever he was doing. And um, the interesting thing was they were a striker unit. And when they got to where they were doing with the Aussies in that area, they parked the strikers and they went back to regular old infantry and they were humping on the ground quite a bit. And uh, I can still remember him complaining one day about how much, you know, <laughs> humping they'd been doing. And I said, but, but son, your infantry, that's what you're supposed to be doing. He goes, yeah, but we trained up on all these striker vehicles. We don't even <laughs> use them. <laughs> So th things like that were nice. So. so describe to me the scenario when you found out that he was lost. Well, yeah, that was, um, that was an interesting day. Um, his mother and I were actually divorced, and, but lived around the corner from each other, literally a block apart. And um, it was five o'clock in the afternoon. I was standing at the copy machine. Uh, at work taking care of some stuff and my son Aaron called me and he was crying and he said I need you to come to mom's right now and I said what's going on and I said he just said dad you got to come to mom I said is it Cody and he said come to mom he, he wouldn't tell me so I got off the phone walked back to my desk um, turned my computer off and thankfully it was just you know three block drive home uh, I hustled out to the parking lot and as I pulled up to uh, Cody's mother's house, uh, I saw the, the two uniformed officers. And um, all the way in that short drive, I had just said, you know, if he's injured, we can handle this. We can take care of it. We can, we can get things. You know, they're, they're doing great things now with, with, on the, with the medical stuff. And as soon as I saw those uniforms, I knew. I knew he was gone. And uh, I got out of my car, walked up. And, it, you know, it was that thousand mile walk that it felt like you know my legs were a thousand pounds and and um they greeted me and then they told me and um they had already been inside and had already told uh his mother and so I went inside and talked to my other two sons and talked to her a little bit uh, I called my pastor um, who was able to come over real quick and and console the boys and then um after that, it was a blur. Um, there was several days of things happening, uh, trying to get things happening going on. Um, the uh, soldier from Fort Hood, which is about uh, two and a half hours from our house, uh, came up and he was our casualty assistance officer. And uh, the interesting thing about that was I had been a casualty assistance officer myself and uh, not for somebody that was killed in action. I actually served on a for, to help with a retired first sergeant who had died of cancer. And I, I took his widow all around Fort Hood and took care of that. So I had been through the training that this young man had been through and sitting on the other side of the table with him telling us the stuff was, was actually pretty surreal. And, um, and then before we knew it, uh, she and I were on a plane to Dover to uh, schedule to meet his, his remains as he came back. So, were you even able to focus on on the casualty assistance officer? Not really, not really. No, um, I I trusted in the system and him. Uh, I knew that he had been through training. This was his first time, you know. And I I put myself in his place. And I understood that you know, he was a sergeant first class, and here's this young PFC, and mom and dad are in shock. And you know, I thought my goodness, there's not any classroom training you can give. This is real-time training. And I you know, put him at ease, worked with him, um, understanding that it was a difficult situation for him. He understand completely that it was a difficult situation for us and um, ended up, he, he did a fantastic job. And one of the interesting things with him was um, 
one of the majors that I had worked with back when I was in Fort Hood was now a two-star general. He was the deputy commanding general at, at uh, Three Corps. And I uh, sent him a letter after this was all done. And I had not kept in touch with them. I just kind of introduced, you know, I don't know if you remember me, sir, blah, blah, blah. But I told him about uh, Sergeant Australia. And I said, he did an outstanding job he, in, a, in a tough situation. And it, as it turns out, uh, Sergeant Australia and his commander were called up to a staff meeting, unbeknownst to them what, as to what was going on. And General Grimley uh, presented him with a coin and recognized him for doing an outstanding job for, you know, for a family. So that was interesting. And when I talked with Sergeant Australia later, he's like, you really should have warned me. I said, I didn't think about that. I'm sorry, but I just wanted you to be recognized for, you know, helping us out so much. That was, that, that's a pretty interesting situation. So you, you, you just lost your son and yet your focus was on, on the person who was helping you through this, yeah. not on yourselves and losing your son. Well, I, I think part of that is, um, both Cody's mom and I were that way. Um, it became, you know, our, our very first interest was he was, uh, he was killed instantly, but there was five other guys that were injured. And so when we communicated with, uh, we got phone calls from his squadron commander and then phone calls from his platoon leader. And, and we talked individually, but uh, both of us, the first thing we asked was, how are the guys? I mean, there was, his, his buddies were hurt and how are they doing? Are they going to be okay? And we got information on that. And um, as it turns out, his, his squadron commander um, was Lieutenant Colonel was two years behind me at the Academy and outstanding leader, uh, super, uh, he's now a two-star general. And that's uh, says a lot for him. Um, and then uh, the phone call with his platoon leader was the one that got me probably the most because uh, I can still remember I went out to my car and plugged my phone into the think charger to make sure I didn't lose the call. And um, I kept thinking, you know, we never talked about this when I was in Desert Storm. We, you know, we never planned on what we had done for phone calls, et cetera. And, and I know, you, you know, I think, I think our colonel had a, a satellite phone, but um, so I just tried to put myself in this young lieutenant's place and is, you know, is what he was going through when he made this call. And uh, he's an extremely young, or extremely nice young man. And um, we talked and you could just tell he was struggling. And I asked about things. And then I, I basically just said, hey, I need you to be in the fight. You're, you're still there. You're still in charge of your men. You know, you got to get back in the game. Um, I heard later on at the, from the, uh, presiding uh, officer that was over Cody Schooner that he got a call from Cody's leadership that said that that phone call snapped Mike back to what he needed to do. Um, and, um, you know, I, something I, it was just, I was on, on mode to just continue. I, I didn't even really think about it, I guess. And to this day, I don't exactly know what words were said other than the gist of it was, Hey, you got to get yourself back in the fight and, you know, we're going to take care of Cody and, and getting him buried. And at some point in time, I want to meet you and, and, and talk with you and, and give you a hug. So that's a pretty, that's a pretty special memory. Um, and uh, along those lines, do you, what is the, the last conversation that you had with Cody? Do you remember what was said? Yeah. And that actually it was, and that's, um, I, one of the reasons why I tell a lot of people about those phone calls is that, you know, what a blessing it was to have clear communications where in, you know, when he called, uh, my time clock stopped at work and I concentrated 100% on that phone call. And we, we you know, we always talked, we left nothing unsaid. Um, there was no doubt in my mind when I knew Cody was gone that I had told him I loved him and I was proud of him continually talked about that and I knew he knew that um, the other thing is I also knew that he was right with the Lord he had a walk with the Lord and, and 
I was confident in that, that if something did happen to him, I knew where he was going, that he was going to be in glory in heaven with his heavenly father. And that was extremely important to me. Um, I couldn't have a faith for Cody, but I, as his dad, I could provide an opportunity for that, like my dad did for me. And to know that he had that faith was, is, gives me the peace that I do have in that sense. So you made a sacrifice that very few Americans make, whether it be actually on the battlefield or giving a loved one so that we may all enjoy days like this. Um, but not only did, did that happen in your family, then your, your, your other boys decided to pick up the same mantle and, and, and walk the same path. I mean, how proud are you as a father that not only did they say, oh my gosh, my brother, he passed on and, and his, his sacrifice is the reason that I'm able to share in these freedoms that we hold every day. Not that they've already not given enough, but they decided to keep going and following his footsteps. That's got to make you and their mother just incredibly proud. We are. We are. It, um, it's, a, it's a scary thing after going through what we went through. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's something that we couldn't have stopped them. I, I didn't give my parents a choice. I was 18 years old and I wanted to go to, to West Point. And I busted my butt to get there. And had they said no, I would have probably said, sorry, I'm going. Um, you know, because they're both boys were, you know, at the age where they could make that decision. Um, but both their mother and I sat them down and talked to them individually and said, you need to do this for you. You don't need to do this because you feel obligated to serve because of Cody's loss. Uh, it needs to be your service to this country and your service alone. And each one of them were right on the money that, yes, this is for me. This is what I need to do. Yes, I'm going to honor my brother, but it's also me serving for, for the country. And I think that's made both of them excellent soldiers. Um, they, they're very quiet about it. They don't advertise that they're gold star brothers, but when people do talk to them, they will talk about it. Uh, my son, Tyler, um, the, one of the first captains he met as a young Lieutenant in Hawaii, he's a military policeman in Hawaii, um, was a gold star father or gold star son himself. His father um, had been killed in Iraq. And so instantly he meets this captain he's going to be working for, and they have an instant bond. They've been through it. They know what it's like as, 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 you know, sons, or sons and brothers, we should say. So, um, and, you know, it, it also, I think it makes them a, a very humble in the sense of their leadership. They know what happens and what can take place. And so when they're training and, and going after it, they keep a, a serious mind to it. They understand this is, it, you know, you got to enjoy yourself. You got to have some fun. But when it comes right down to it, it's a serious business and lives depend on it. So Yeah, for them, war is not romanticized. It, no. It's real. No, it was not them going off and saying, I'm going to try to do the same thing or I'm going to go get medals. It was, hey, I'm going to serve and, and honor my brother. So, so. Again, you know, you and your family uh, made a sacrifice that that very few people um, can can fully understand. What did you take away from this whole thing? I mean, it's real easy to be bitter. It's real easy to be angry. There's a lot going on in this country right now that 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 we can point to, and and this is this is not a political conversation, and nor will, yeah. will we go there. But what is the takeaway that you have from the loss of your son on this Father's Day? That's a that's interesting. Um, well, first and foremost, I'm I'm most proud to be an American. Uh, I love this country, which is why I serve myself, um, and I enjoy the I love the freedoms that we enjoy. Um, and I I look back at the the history we have and guys like my grandfather that went over in World War II and fought for these freedoms. And 
and shed blood. I mean, my, my grandfather was a decorated hero and he had, uh, was also injured. He had purple hearts and, and um, he served in both World War II and Korea. And um, do I like that uh, I have that unfortunate label of being a gold star father? No, but I am proud of his service and sacrifice. Um, Cody was doing what he wanted to do. He was proud to put that uniform on and he was, he was proud of his accomplishments. Um, he had received his uh, CIB before he was killed. And that was a very important thing for him. Um, his combat infantry badge. Yes. And he, he actually kind of gave me a hard time about it because I'm an artilleryman and my grandfather was an infantryman in World War II. So he had a CIB. And I still, one of the conversations was, hey, dad, I got my CIB today. And I'm like, well, that's awesome. He said, yeah, you, you, great grandpa and I have one. And I said, yep. They did. But I said, artillery is just as good, son. <laughs> so we always <laughs> had that, you know, that fun banter. But, um, you know, just the, the fact that as a young, young man, he was willing to step up and say, send me, I'll go. I'll, you know, we, we've got this issue over there. And. I'm going to go take care of it. Not many young men do that. Not many young women do that. Uh, you know, and we are in a different time frame. Um, Cody was eight days shy of his 20th birthday when he was killed. Um, in fact, we actually ran into a situation where the funeral almost happened on the day of his birthday. And we, his mother said, absolutely not. I'm not burying him on his birthday. So we were able to um, and it was it was dealing with the uh, national cemetery opening, um, and and um, the two star general at Fort Sill did us a special favor and opened it specifically for Cody, so that we could have his funeral on a day that wasn't his birthday. So that was very respectful of him. Well, yeah. In fact, I can. Um, in it, it didn't doesn't hurt that. Uh, uh, his grandfather on his mother's side uh, was a retired command sergeant major and, and knew that uh, two star real well when he was a lieutenant. So uh, that helps. Yeah, that helps. But um, I can still remember my dad at the, at the graveside coming up to me afterwards and said, There was a command sergeant major and a two star general up there. And I said, Yes. And he goes, But Cody was just a private. And I said, Yeah, he was a private first class. But I said, that's the kind of brotherhood that we have in the military, that you can have a two-star general that will go down and honor a private first class. You'll have a command sergeant major that will go down and honor it. At that point in time, it doesn't matter the rank. It's the respect for that individual and the sacrifice they made. And yeah, and you were telling me that, that uh, you were actually at a function where there were quite a few Medal of Honor recipients, and the way they were the way they were snapping to and, and talking to you as a gold star father, the, the respect and appreciation that you received from that, I think even astounded you. Yes. Yes. I, I was, a uh, my son, Aaron and I were guests of uh, Debbie Lee um, at the uh, sky Ball, And it was the special operations, the year they did the special operations. And there was a number of metal, Medal of Honor recipients, and she was introducing us to them, and both my son and I were just amazed at how, you know, these individuals that were this Medal of Valor that is so honored, were honored to meet us, a Gold Star family, and understood our sacrifice. And then at another point in time when I got to meet um, Woody Williams, who did the um, help doing he's honoring gold star families with memorials in different uh, cities throughout the country and there's one here in McKinney and that was phenomenal to meet him with his background in Iwo Jima and and his age and he's just a fireball of a guy and he you know to have somebody like that honoring us made it really very very special well we uh we can't thank you enough. Um, you know, it, it's a, a harrowing statistic is that only one out of four Americans, you know, and, and these, I understand that these statistics can be somewhat disputed, but only one out of four Americans either serve or even volunteer for their communities in some form or fashion. 
And it is, it, it's unfortunate that we can't flip that number upside down. But when we have Americans like your son, your other sons who are following his footsteps and all the sacrifices that your family has made, it gives us all a lot of hope. And so I just want to say on this Father's Day, number one, happy Father's Day to you. You've earned it more than most. And number two, thank you for all you and your family have sacrificed so that my family and I can enjoy the freedoms that we do. I appreciate that. Thank you. Really, really special. I mean, we're blessed that we have the, the men and women that are serving now that have taken that step and, and are, are out there in harm's way for us and for our freedoms. So, Well, again, Chris, thank you very much for taking your time today on Father's Day to join us for sharing uh, Cody's story. Uh, again, we, we, we can't thank you enough. Uh, and hopefully this is just one small way to show it. But um, again, happy Father's Day. And for all of you out there uh, in Carry the Load land, thanks for joining us again for another uh, Lessons from the Front. Um, as always, I'd kind of like to remind you of two things. Number one, I want you to, to always keep in mind what it means when we say be the flag. And number two is always have a good answer for the question of who are you carrying? Thank you very much, and we look forward to the next time. Thank you, Todd.